Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I know it's been a while since I've been up here, so if you forgot who I am, my name's Neil, and uh, it's great to have you all in our service this morning. And uh, just one more uh, announcement before we jump into things. The community garden that some of you have kind of watched come together out there is ready to get started. So if you'd like to sign up for a plot, you can do that. You can do that online. Just There's an email address, communitygarden at hopechapelsterling.org. You can just email us. I'd love to have a plot. But Jen Knipe, who's, Jen, what is that? she's here in the building, and she's going to be out in the lobby afterwards. Some of you say, ah, you know, I don't really eat vegetables. Well, grow them to give them away to somebody else or to give them to a to a, a food pantry or whatever but so and you can get all kinds of sizes and that kind of thing we're hoping it's a great ministry outreach so so many of you didn't know who don't know who John and Sheila Miner are John and Sheila lived in Lemonster were a charter members founding members of Hope Chapel at the very first service back in April of 2002 and um, they now live in Michigan where they've retired and uh, they must have a lot of vills out there because he's referred to, to Hudsonville instead of Hudson. But, uh, and, uh, and, and actually, our first three elders were all named John. So we had first John, second John, and third John. So we're very biblical. We're right on target. But as you can tell, we're entering into a 20th anniversary kind of season. And some of it, you know, we just want to take a moment and look back and celebrate what God's done. And I've been doing that a little bit in my columns and doing that. Uh, we're going to do that through some additional videos as we go forward over the next few weeks. And, uh, but I'm also praying that this time of just kind of slowing down and, and taking a look at what God's done is what, uh, you know, my prayer has been that God would use it to reignite a pioneering spirit to expand the kingdom. You know, it's, it's really pretty easy sometimes to, to get settled in and just get comfortable. You know, it's like going to your grandmother's house that's, and everything in the house is 25 years out of date. Right, because they're just comfortable in it. And, and I'm praying that God will use this season to renew our, our passion, if you will, to have a pioneering spirit to, to expand the kingdom in the areas where he's calling us to, to do that. And so I want to do a three-week series called Guideposts. And, and what I want to do is I want to look at some passages of Scripture that have been truly formative in shaping who Hope Chapel is and what we've done over these 20 years. Now, they weren't always necessarily theme verses that we would have on the passages of Scripture and things that we were preaching through all the time, but these were the kinds of passages behind the scenes that were impacting leaders, impacting me, and shaping kind of what it is that we did and what we wanted to, where we wanted to go and what we were really asking God to do. And I want to look at a few verses uh, over the next few weeks looking at that called guideposts, things that God used to point us along the way. So, I mean, our strategy from the very beginning, our mission has really never changed. We, we launched Hope Chapel to be a Luke 15 church. Now, if you don't know Luke 15, Luke 15 has three parables in it. Jesus is getting criticized by the religious leaders for hanging out with sinners. And he tells the story of the night uh, of the shepherd who comes back one day and there's 99 sheep in his pen, but there's one missing. And even though there's 99 there and there's plenty of work to do, he goes out and he looks for the one that's missing. Then he tells the story of the parable of the, the widow who lost her coin, who turns her house upside down until she finds it because it's precious. And then, of course, the story that we're most familiar in to, with is the pro story of the prodigal son. And we set out from the very beginning to be a congregation that not only ministered to the sheep, but was looking to go out for those who weren't inside the pen yet. And so we, we understood that, that our, our, our mission was to come alongside and be Christ in the world as the body of Christ and to be about seeking and saving that which is lost. Now, our strategy to do that was was really simple and you know in the early days as we were growing and that kind of stuff other church planters would ask well what are you guys doing why is it what you know why are you growing because we, we had a season in there for all the way up through probably the first three or four years in the building where we grew in attendance every single quarter we had more people were regularly attending every single quarter for almost the first 10 years of our life and guys well, what are you doing and and our strategy 
wasn't profound. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't sophisticated, but it was powerful. And, and, and here's how I describe it. It says, we just, every single week, we want to get better at loving God and loving people. If every single week we can take some kind of a step in learning how to love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to learn out how to love our neighbors as ourselves better, if we, can, if we can just do that every single week, everything that we hope and dream for, that God would take all the sacrifice that we're making, to make that all of it was going to come to reality. And that strategy hasn't changed today. Our mission hasn't changed, and our strategy hasn't changed. Now, the vision will change, and we'll be talking about that in the upcoming months as we move into a new series, post-mortgage and all that kind of stuff. But, but we, we really, the, the idea of the fact that we're here to be a Luke 15 church, we're here about those, we are here in this place, and our mission is about those who aren't here. Does that make sense? And the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to learn collectively, individually, how to fall more in love with God and how to love our, pe- our neighbors more completely. Now, underneath all of that, there was a prayer that was going on. There, 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 there was just a sense. I, I used to meet every single week with one of our early church leaders. We'd pull up in, 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 onto the property that had been given to us, bequeathed to us by Sterling Baptist Church that... that, that uh, disbanded, and we'd meet there, and we'd pray together every Thursday morning. And, um, and, and there were lots of prayers that ran on, but there was an underlying spirit underneath it. And, and I will tell you that the, the passage of Scripture that is, the, it's a partial part of it because our wall's not big enough, but the passage of Scripture that you see on the wall behind, as you walk into the office was reflective of our sp- prayer. This is, uh, may the God of hope fill you with all joy. And and it doesn't stop there. That's Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And we're going to go there in just a minute. But it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple years after we moved into the building, Carol Albee, who's with the Lord now, uh, put this up on the wall. And it's a great reminder every single time when we, we walk in. Now, I can't stand, stand here and tell you today that way back in 2002 that God gave me this verse of Scripture to pray. But I will tell you the things that we prayed about regularly by ourselves and, and, and as small teams as we gather together are very much reflected in the spirit of this prayer. And if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn to Romans chapter 15. We're just going to look at this single verse, and I'm going to flip over to a couple of other places. If you're using one of the Bibles that's up underneath your chair, you're going to find our text today on page 1008, 1008. And I, I want to, before I read this again, I, I want to put it in context and what's happening in the book of Romans. So, so you see just how pivotal it is for the Apostle Paul. Now, again... At this point in time in his journey, the Apostle Paul had never been to the city of Rome. He wanted to go. He felt like planting the gospel, having a faithful, founded, grounded, healthy witness to the gospel at the center of the Roman Empire, which was literally the center of the world in those days, that that was pivotal for God to be able to change the world that he wanted to. And he longed to go to Rome, but he hadn't been there yet. So, in, so he wrote a letter. Turned out to be 16 chapters in our Bibles. Right? Back then it was just a scroll. No verse numbers, no chapters. He just wrote a scroll. And, and he, was trying to, he was trying to ground his church from a distance. So in the first 11 chapters, what, what Paul talks about is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. He talks about the fact that the only way that you and I can have an active, living, saving, eternal relationship with Christ, with, with, the, with God, is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, for him as a Jew who's trying to share the gospel also with Gentiles, that whole thing created all kinds of issues for them, right? And because, first of all, he grew up as a Pharisee trying to follow all the law, and that's the way you got into heaven, 
And how could that emphasis, because he still loved that same God, how could the God of law also be the God of grace? And how could the law serve as a precursor to a substitutionary atonement, in other words, a righteousness that's given to us rather than earned by us? How could that all work out? And he spends all this time unpacking the, the redemptive activity of God and explaining it theologically. I'm not going to go into all of that today. It also flows out from there as the fact that that message was not just for the Jews, but the Jews were God's pinpoint of being able to open it up so it's available to all of us who will believe. And he does that in the first 11 chapters. Chapters 12 through 15, he says, Now, given the fact that that's all been accomplished, use Jesus' words from the cross, it's finished. He said, this is the way you can live, and this is who you can be, and this is how you should work together as the body of Christ. And so he begins to unpack all of that in, in chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15. He's talking about literally everything that's available for us and the ways that we can live, the ways we can relate to God, all this, the marvelous stuff that's hard to put into words. And when he gets done with all of that, as he gets ready to transition to his future plans and say his greetings and stuff, he concludes all of those 15 chapters, if you will, with this simple prayer. So he's standing in history, he's looking back, he's looking all the way back to before the, plant, the founding of the world, he's looking at the Garden of Eden, he's looking at the life of Abraham, Moses, right on down the line, through David, up to the birth of Christ, all of his life, and his own encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road, and when he gets done with all of that and what it means for us, this is the prayer that he prays for them, this is the prayer that he prays for us. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When, when we were launching Hope Chapel, one of the things that drew me out of the ministry I was in, it was an effective ministry, it was a ministry I loved, it was something I was good at. I enjoyed it, all those kinds of things. And there was a lot of resistance. But one of the things that God was really using in my life was that for, for this kind of a prayer to come to pass, I needed to get back into the, into the video ministry with people. Working for a denomination, you see a lot of people in, in, in Polaroids. You see them on a Sunday, you don't see them again for a year. Right? You know, just see them with Polaroids because you're, you're just working in and out of churches. That's a vital ministry, a great encouragement. But I, I felt for a lot of things I needed to get back into where it was life on life and you got to see the videotape. And a, what, what God was really using in my life was there is way more to our walk with God than the vast majority of his church is experiencing. And so Paul... When he thinks about everything that God's done, the prayer that he prays to make sure that we don't leave one crumb on the table, but that we enjoy it, we consume it all, it's all ours. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to unpack that prayer today. And and. and I, we're going to move fairly quickly, but one of the things I want, so what I'm asking you to do, I want, I'm, I'm challenging you to be somebody who prays this prayer. And I'm also challenging you to be the answer to this prayer. That somehow or another, God uses you in the life of other people to fulfill this prayer. Now, I'm going to use a little outline that, that's not original to me. I've shaped it from me, but it actually comes out of a, a, a out of, some notes that I have from a class that I took with Dr. Curtis Vaughn, who was my, one of my New Testament professors at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary way back in the 1980s. So, so to figure that this is one of those times where you put the DOS floppy disk in and you turned it on and then you pulled it out and then you put in the Word floppy disk and then you typed up and then you pulled that out and then you put in the data disk. and you, That's when I went to seminary, all right? So a long time ago, and I still have those handwritten notes, and I still have a couple of the, the old commentaries that he had. 
And, 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 and he, let's just unpack this prayer for us. Right? Very first thing that I want you to see out of this prayer is that God is just aching for us to live a life in direct contact with him. God is just, as I pray for you, as I've ministered over these years, as the church has ministered, God's, God's passion, God's desire, all that he's done, and his prayer that is, is that you and I would live a life that's in direct contact with God. You know, one, one of the things that I was convinced of as we got started was that th there was still a longing for God in our communities. People hadn't given up on God. They had just given up on the church as a place to find God. You know, they, they went there and they left and some nice stuff happened, but they had really no understanding of how that really connected with them. There wasn't any direct contact with God. And, and that, that to me is just a, a, a powerful idea. I, I think so, so easy. You know, we, we, can, we can conceptualize of God in so many different ways. You know, for some of us, you know, church and God is a coping mechanism. It, it's, it's, it's what I lean on just to get through the week. That's not bad, but that's not what God's longing for. For, uh, for others, God, God is the, the faith, if you will, the church is, is somehow or another, it's a, it's a philosophy or an idea, and I'm trying to master everything that they can teach me so somehow I can use it. it that's a part of it, but that is not what God's longing for. Just, just like as a parent, you are not longing to have every detail of your kid's biography down on paper. What you're longing for is to spend time with your kids. Right? And the older you get, the more you long for it. When they're around, when they're little, sometimes you wish they just go away. But you get to a time in your life, it's like, man, I, you know what? This is precious moments. It's not just an idea. It's not just knowing the facts. It's, way beyond. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a campaign platform for social justice. It, it, it's not. God aches for you and I to live our lives in direct contact with him. I mean, you can see it from the very beginning where God comes into the garden to walk with Adam and Eve. He's longing to live in relationship. You know, every time now I, I hop in the car and drive off to Peabody just to have dinner with our son and daughter-in-law and grandchild, you know, I, you know, I think th this, is, this is what motivated God. He, he just wanted to have direct experiences with his children, with his creation. And, and God's, God's prayer for us, the reason he did all 15 chapters of the book of Romans, extending all the way back to pre-creation, was so that you and I can live our lives in direct contact with God. Now may God fill you. There's a direct line between those things. And, and the only way to have that line for eternity and for now the only way to really come to the Father is by Christ. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. And that's just not just a reference to heaven. That's a reference. No one comes to the Father but by me. And, and as Paul's looking through all this stuff, and he's thinking about everything God's done, he says the reason he's done that is God, God wants to have a personal relationship with every single person who's made in his image. And that's all of us. And, and it's not just an idea. It's not just a self-help thing. One of the most glaring moments we ever had is we had, we had an individual who was coming. They were going through a hard time in their life. Eventually, they kind of cleared that, and that was in their rearview mirror. And they kind of stopped coming. We reached out and said, well, you know, I needed church then, but I'm in a better place now. I don't need church anymore. I've got to tell you, religion may have helped her, but that's not the same thing as having a relationship with God. And that's what God longs for. And that's what God is, is working for in our lives. If you need affirmations, you know, this is why G the scripture, Jesus, the last thing he said to his disciples, man, I'm with you always, right? That's why the psalmist is saying there's no place you can go from my presence. 
It's why Paul writes about in the, earlier in the book of Romans that there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. God longs to have a direct relationship, a direct contact with you and I as we go forward. Here's the second truth I want you to see. God wants us to have an overflowing life. Now, you, you could draw this out. Actually, he uses the word overflow, so that makes it pretty easy to make a direct line to this point, right? But you could go, look, just what I'll say. All, he uses words like all, right, and filled. and accept. God wants our experience of him to be overwhelming, but in a good way. You know, and you're going to hear a little bit more about this next week in the passage that I want to share. But, but there, were, there are way too many precious children of God who are settling for a mediocre experience of God. And that's not what God wants. God didn't do everything that he did. Not only in the Old Testament, but particularly in his son Jesus. He didn't do all of that so our walk with him could be okay. You know, that's a mess. It could be worse, could be better, but you know, it's okay. That's not what God signed up for. That's, not, that's what he wants, right? That everything that we have to be so poured into us that it's just overflowing. And, you know, the illustration that I, I used early on, right, until I got chastised enough that I was tempting people in the services and all that. But so when I was in denominational ministry, I traveled all around New England because we had churches, 350 churches spread out in all six states. And so several of the areas that I went to, the pastors loved to gather in these all-you-could-eat buffet restaurants. They weren't Chinese buffet restaurants, but they kind of had like everything. And one of them was just north of Hartford, Connecticut. It's probably out of business now because of COVID, right? So you just can't do that stuff anymore. But one of the things I liked about it was that it was all you could eat ice cream at the end. <laughs> you know, the soft serve stuff? You know, and, and listen, it, when you get to be a pro at that, because you've done it a few times, you know you go over and they got these little cup things out. And you're thinking, you know what, I'm going for the soup bowls. You know, and, and you get one of the soup bowls and you bring it back and you, you fill it up and you sprint it in and then you pour on the chocolate syrup and then there go the nuts and then there go some jimmies. And when you, and you're carrying it back, you're, you're kind of embarrassed, but you're glad because it's just spilling over the top and it's dripping and it's, you know, and it's just overflowing. That is exactly the imagery that God would use about how he wants our experience of him to be. He doesn't, he doesn't want it to be where it's just a small little dessert cup with just a little dot of ice cream in the bottom, right? You know, where you can go somewhere and spend $9 on one scoop, right? You know, he, he wants this to have it's overflowing. He wants it to be in abundance. Listen, if, if there's a truth that we need to know is that our God is not a God of scarcity. He is a God of abundance. The stuff that he's trying to pour into us, he wants to give us in an overwhelming sense. And my, our prayer all the way along is, God, don't use our ministry just so that people have an okay experience with Christ. Somehow or another, let's engage people, connect with people, serve people, pour into people, let people serve, let, do whatever's necessary for them to have an overwhelming experience. An overflowing experience of the love of God, of the purposes of God, the joy of God. And you can just go right on down the line. I don't have enough time to go any, any, any longer. Now, that overflowing life, there are three primary characteristics that Paul gives us here. Joy, peace, and hope. Let me read it again for us, right? Now, may the God of hope... So God's imparting his nature to us. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope, right? His purpose for us is so that you and I can have lives, lives that are overflowingly characterized by joy, peace, and hope. Now, I had a, wish I had a whole time. I mean, these could be a, a sermon all to themselves, these, one of these points. Just very quickly, joy, joy is not happiness. Happiness is an emotion. 
Joy is a quality. It, it, it is a spiritual quality. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, right? Th this is something that God gives us. And it, it is a quality. It is a perspective, an attitude. I, I, I think of it as like, it's like a life culture that allows us to, to experience what is good in that journey. Uh, so, somebody once said, it's like carrying your own weather with you, right? So it's, so it's always 78 degrees and sunny with a gentle breeze. You know, when, when you're walking with joy, you're carrying your own weather with you as you go through life. So even as things go up and down or whatever, there's just this prevailing sense that God is good. And that goodness is in, in our lives. Then he talks about peace. Again, we often think about, man, I just want some peace and quiet. <laughs> in this. I mean, we just want the absence of conflict. But this word is much more. This, this, is, this is God giving us everything that we need to be able to flourish. It is the presence of everything that we need to be spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally healthy. To be experiencing all of that. This, this, this is God's gift to us. He wants us to have a spirit of peace. And then there's hope. And hope in, in many ways is, is the idea of, of that which is in the future that we know to be true is transforming our present. It gives us the reason why we do what we do. Why we know we can have all. And so he said, I want your life to be just overflowing, right? I want it to be like one of those dessert bowls that just can't hold all that of the joy and peace and hope that I pray. And this is his prayer for us. This is why God's done everything up to this point, so that you and I can live in direct contact with him, right? And our lives can be overflowing with joy and peace and hope. But it takes faith. You can't read this passage of scripture and move away from it as you believe, right? The only way this prayer gets answered in your life or in my life is by faith. It takes faith. It absolutely takes faith. It takes an initial faith decision to walk with Christ, and then it takes uh, then it takes faith as we live every single day. Day. And boy, I wish I had a lot of on time to pack this, but let me, let me put it this way. You know, faith is, is the ability for us not to let our circumstances, not to let our expectations be dictated by our circumstances, but by the God that we work with. And I could unpack some things from our journey. I mean, you know, first of all, ju just the whole journey that we took on about trying to buy this land and build this building on paper by any stretch of imagination, even with a healthy dose of faith, the answer was, this makes no sense at all. I mean, we were a congregation of about 80 to 100, maybe 120. It kind of depended on the week and the season, right? And, 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 our, and we had like a $180,000 budget, and we were taking on a $2.5 million project. And, and even the best church consultants would say, you're not ready. But somehow or another, in the midst of that, we believed that God was calling us to do it at that time, right? And, and it, so you can't, you, faith is that ability not to let your actions be determined by your circumstances, but by what you believe to be true. Let me say that in just a, in maybe in a different way. This, faith is the ability for you and I to be, live our lives not by what works, but by what God wants. Let that sink in for just a minute, right? Faith is the ability to, to, to have this prayer answered as we believe so that we can be filled with joy, hope, and peace. So it's over. The way that works is that it, it's, it's we don't live our lives saying, all right, this was what will work. We look at it by this is what God wants, right? This is God's will for us. This is who God's asking us to be. And it is you and I are living that way that we are exercising faith and this prayer begins to get answered. Does that, does that make any sense? You know, because so often, I, I remember one time in our journey, we were working through the, some, some of the teachings of Jesus and my kids were much younger. They were like in junior, ju junior high school or whatever. And we were talking about turn the other cheek and pray for those who persecute you. And go, you know, and one of them said, Dad, that, that'll never work at my school. 
you know, if you do that, then you're just going to end up being the doormat, and everybody's going to pick on you or whatever, that kind of stuff. So, you know, and, and so that's what works, right? That's what works. And some of us, we, we, you know, it's so easy to say, you know, what works is, is a dog-eat kind of world. Do it to them before they do it to you, da-da-da-da-da, you know, and et cetera. And, and, and we just live that way. And that's totally different than doing what God wants us to do. And faith is living our lives not by what we what works, but by what we want. I got one last piece. A life endowed with power. Notice that he, he says, so you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Boy, I, I, I want to read a passage from, from 2 Peter. This is a passage that's been very influential to us in our last few years. We're in, in, in verse 3 of chapter 1. Peter writes at God's inspiration. He says, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And, and when he talks about you and I living our lives with power, it's actually being able to live the life that God wants for us, a life that is marked by godliness right and and godliness is not a piety where we look like a monk and blah, 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 but it's it's getting to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth it's it's to base off of steve's sermons the last few weeks it's when god tags us we're ready to go into the game and we're ready to be the people and do it whether it's to serve to share or to pass it on to others we are ta- god wants us to have the sense that you and i are enabled we are empowered. We are capable of actually doing what he's asked us to do. And, and that's his prayer for us. To live a life in direct connection with him. A life that's overflowing with joy and peace and hope. Because we have a faith. And we're ready to be the people and live the lives that God has for us. That prayer was driving and still drives what we do at Hope Chapel. It may come out in life groups and VBSs and outreach programs and doing this service projects. It may come out in all different ways, but this is a prayer that's below it. And here's what I'm asking you to do today. One, will you pray that prayer with me? Will you just make a commitment to pray that prayer with me? Pray it for yourself. Pray it for me. Pray it for Hope Chapel. Will you just commit to pray in the spirit of this prayer for yourself, for the church, for me? Secondly, will you truly be open to letting God use you to answer that prayer in the life of somebody else? And if you've never taken the step of faith to begin that journey of belief, Would you take that step today? Let's pray together. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.